Hey guys, welcome to the 100th episode on the channel. Now obviously we've done about 230 videos, but 100 of them have been considered weekly episodes. And so I want to go back and revisit the third episode we ever did, which was Snakes as Pets, and kind of do a little bit different approach to that, but discuss some of those things that we discussed back then. I also want to give you some news and updates on what's going on here and with the channel. And so stay tuned and check that out. So to help us with this video, I have one of my marble Borneo short tail pythons here. This one was actually hatched out in a joint project between Rob Christian and I with him being the one who hatched them. So you guys have seen her before on live streams and things like that. Jenka, please go. Uh, so short tail pythons and, and blood pythons obviously are one of my favorite animals and I think they make fantastic pets, but that doesn't mean that they're the right pets for everyone. And so I think when you're getting into getting a pet snake, whether it's the first time, a new species, or anything, I think that you need to consider a certain list of factors before you make the selection of the animal. And so you need to boil it down to simple things and some more complicated. Obviously, size of the animal overall as an adult needs to be considered both for the space you have within your home or where you're going to live uh, in the future, and also just your ability to handle the animal. An animal this size, obviously, anyone can handle. Uh, as an adult female, uh, she could get a little bit big for some people, uh, but typically short tails are pretty safe for you know any adult to handle as long as you don't have any real restrictions um, and, and things like that. But when you look into your Burmese pythons, your reticulated pythons, your anacondas, even some of the larger boa species, uh, there's some animals that can get very, very powerful and can be very dangerous in the wrong hands. So does that mean that they're mean animals and, and to be distrusted? No. It just means that you have to understand that these are animals and just like people, uh, you know, a, a larger person can be more dangerous than a smaller person, you know, when we don't consider weapons and all these other things. So you have to be, uh, to be prepared for these bigger animals and understand what you're doing. I, I think one of the dangerous things in the hobby now is, you know, we all want to push how wonderful these animals are and they are, but you see people that have no experience jumping right into a reticulated python, and I think that's a really big mistake. Uh, and, you know, I don't mean the pun there, really big, because they get really big. Uh, but that is a dangerous animal. And just because something is potentially dangerous doesn't make it bad, doesn't make it evil or mean. It just means that you need to be responsible and know how to appropriately handle that animal. So size is definitely an important thing to consider. Uh, care and husbandry is another thing that really needs to go into your thought process. How much time do you have to dedicate to this animal? What's your schedule like? You know, are you a person that likes to travel four or five, six times a year all over the place? Long weekends, week trips here, go on a two week cruise. Some of these animals can withstand that kind of stuff. Some of them are more sensitive. So you need to make sure that your lifestyle, this new animal that you're bringing in is gonna fit in with that uh, safely. You also need to look at the cost of the animal. Keeping one snake, no matter the species, is not going to be incredibly uh, cost prohibitive. But once again, if you get into those larger species that are going to eat larger meals, and something like a retic has a, a fairly fast metabolism for a large snake. Uh, now, obviously, people tend to overfeed in captivity in general, but you still are going to expect at least a few hundred dollars a year in expenses for that animal, and that's that's minimal. Uh, now, a smaller snake, like a rat snake or something like that, might not cost you so much um, in space, time, and all those other things, but every species needs to be considered for what it is. Laws are another thing to consider, especially if you don't own your home and you don't know that you're going to be staying in the state that you live in, the county you live in, the town you live in, the country you live in for a long period of time. Um, every, you know, there's federal laws, obviously, and then there's state laws county laws, city ordinances, uh, and even homeowners associations that you have to consider when you're going to purchase a new animal. It is not advisable at any point to be keeping an animal that's illegal or against regulations for whatever reason where you live. Uh, you see every year people having to get rid of their pets because they broke a pet policy uh, where they rent, uh, which is really foolish. Uh, it's not, you know, a joke. If, if something in your lease says you can't have these animals, don't do it because ultimately the animals are going to suffer uh, while you figure it out because at some point maintenance is going to have to come in or a neighbor's going to rat you out 
or somebody's gonna see you moving huge cages into your house and wondering what's going on. It's just not an advisable thing to do. Uh, we've all made mistakes in keeping before. I'm not vilifying anybody or anything like that, but if you're going about looking into getting new animals, uh, it's best to make sure that you're within line of these things. Caging, as we mentioned, is an important thing to consider, not only for the cost, but you look at some of the lead times on these companies. Uh, as your snakes are growing, you need to kind of stay ahead of the curve. So these animals can grow very rapidly and uh, very quickly they'll, they'll get more confident and be ready for more space, depending on the species once again. And when you're considering the caging, I also think it's important to consider what you want out of the animal at the same time. I see a lot of people looking to purchase a, a short tail python that they want to put on display. This is not a display animal. This is not an animal that wants to sit in a cage and be stared at all day. It wants to feel secure. These animals very naturally don't move around a lot. They find a good hiding place and they stay there. Doesn't make them a good candidate for that. So it's not really fair to the animal to force them into a situation that's unnatural and uncomfortable for them. Uh, and now obviously there can be individuals with different personalities that are more bold than others that might do better in that situation than others. So even when selecting a species, you still have to look at the individual animal too. But I think it's best in that case, like for me, I have my rat snake, my McLots pythons. They're in display cages. They don't mind it at all. They're very active. They're very nosy. They're always out seeing what I'm doing. Now they'll often hide during the day, but the moment I come home from work and start moving around in here and they hear all that commotion, they'll start to come out and check out things. They'll be front and center. If you open the door, they'll come right forward and out. They're not nervous, they're not retreating. Uh, now my McLots Python, if I touch him, he will retreat. He doesn't really like to be handled, but uh, as far as in his cage and on display, he's not nervous at all. My Olive Python, same thing. They don't mind being seen and there'll still be times they're in shed. They'll go in their hide or maybe just once in a while, they just wanna relax and get out of sight. But I would say 65 to 80% of the time they're out and about paying attention to what's going on around them. So you're going to have a much better experiencing picking a species that fits what you want from it than trying to force an animal to kind of fit into your box of what you're looking for. So when you're, when you're selecting an animal, write these factors down on a sheet of paper and then talk to people that work with these species or whatever it is that you need to do, research on them, look at their natural behavior and try to check these boxes and find something that's gonna fit in best with what you want. Uh, that can even go so far as diurnal versus nocturnal and all that. Uh, you know, if you wanna handle a snake, do you wanna handle it a lot? Do you wanna handle it a little? Oftentimes people that are getting these animals as just a pet are gonna to want to handle their animals. They're gonna to want to see them more. And so selecting a species like a rat snake that's very tolerant of that in most cases, or a king snake or a milk snake, depending on the species and the individual animal once again. Uh, you know, short tail pythons and blood pythons actually handle handling really, really well when they're comfortable with their keeper. I mean, as you can see in, in basically all the videos on my channel, I have my animals a lot out a lot. I'm not cutting and editing this animal, it's just sitting here doing this, I'm moving around the animal, it's not giving me any adverse reaction. Yes, her tongue flicks are moving, her head's moving, but she's not nervous, she's not pulling back. Her tongue flicks are curious right now and good. So knowing your animal's behavior, getting them comfortable with you, they tolerate handling really well. But I don't take this snake out three or four times a week. She might come out, you know, once every couple of weeks. I have enough snakes where I could do that. But I do think something like a Sumatran short tail could handle uh, several handling sessions a week safely. As long as you're giving them ample time when they're shedding or ample time when they're digesting food and not bothering them, uh, and as long as they're giving you good, healthy, you know, body language cues, they're not nervous. You know, this is a very relaxed animal, especially in a position like this. It's very unnatural holding this animal up in the air. Uh, this takes a lot of trust between her and I. She knows that I'm not going to hurt her. And so she's not nervous. If I saw her presenting with nervous behavior, then I would not be doing that with her right now. But she's, she's very confident and calm. So learning your animals is a big part of successful keeping and being willing to learn the species is gonna make for a better pet situation for you. Now, as far as where to source the animals from, my advice will always be the same on this. Find somebody passionate about the species that you're looking into uh, that breeds them and works with them on a daily basis. And that's gonna be your best source to purchase from. You may pay a little bit more money than your, your pet store or your reptile show. And I'm not saying that you can't get good animals at either, either place 
Um, cause reptile shows, there's a lot of breeders there, but I think it's better if you research in advance and go to a reptile show knowing who you're interested in purchasing from and who you're not interested in purchasing from. So you don't make an impulse decision. I can't tell you how many times those of us that breed spend a lot of time talking to people and educating them and helping them. And then they ask what you have available and you tell them and your snake's $400 and they find something similar for $300 and they go and buy it. I, what? <laughs> um, and they go and buy it from someone else. And a week later, two weeks later, a month later, three months later, they have a problem. They're coming back to you because that person that they bought it from is not helpful. And so you have to understand what you're paying for when you get a pet, especially if you're less experienced and it's a new species or whatever the case may be. Your best bet is somebody knowledgeable in your corner that you've invested in and shown you appreciate what they're doing in their knowledge and they're going to help you. So had you paid that 100 extra dollars, now you have a lifetime worth of my help or whoever's help that you purchased from and that's part of what you're paying for. You're paying for the after service, you're paying for help when you have a problem, the ability to bounce off ideas and, and share things. And I, I can tell you from people that have bought snakes from me, I love updates, I'll reach out sometimes, ask people how animals are doing. You know, I try not to bother people too much, but I'm curious, I spent time with these animals before they left here. Um, you form some kind of, kind of bond with those animals before they leave. I try to avoid that with animals that are for sale. Uh, just because it makes it harder on the animal and me. Uh, and I'm not saying from a, uh, you know, like a love standpoint, like these, this animal loves me and it's going to be so hurt going somewhere else. But this animal trusts me and gets used to how I handle it. The sound of my voice and the vibrations it's used to. Uh, the smells in my house. The everything here. So when you send this animal to a new environment with a new person that... Even if they, they try to handle it the same, their body temperature could be different. The way they're supporting the weight could be different. The inflection of their voice, all these things, the snake has to relearn a whole new thing. And so they can, it can be an experience for them as well as it is for the person to get to know their animal. So keep that in mind when you're getting animals, where you buy them from. Quality uh, costs more, but it's worth more in the end. And a lot of times it'll save you money in the back end. You know, you buy a cheaper animal from somebody that doesn't really care that much about them. Not only are you now looking for somebody to find information from that may or may not be helpful to you because, you know, you've shown that you'd rather invest in somebody else than them. Uh, but also, you know, health. You might end up with health issues with the animal and one vet visit is going to cost you more than $100, uh, especially for an exotic. It's going to cost you that just to walk in the door, let alone anything you might need. So getting an animal from somebody that, that values health and well-being and, and trying to make genetically, you know, animals that are genetically stronger than weaker, you know, all these things factor in. So I don't want to drag this out too long. So we'll kind of cut the end of the video there other than we are going to discuss for those of you that care what's going on here, what's going on with the channel quickly. Uh, today, my big T positive female just had her pre-lay shed. Uh, so I'm going to clean her up in a little bit. She's not really dirty, but obviously she shed. So I'm going to take that out of there, start getting her set up. Uh, working towards laying eggs. Now it could be anywhere from about 26 to 50 days. I'm really hoping it's before 45 days because I have a trip planned at the end of May. Uh, so I'm not going to be here. I have somebody on call already if a clutch needs to be pulled. But obviously I would much rather have all those eggs pulled before I depart. So I have one more female. My skunk line female is in her pre-lay shed right now. She should probably shed tonight or tomorrow. Uh, so she's going to be probably cutting it close. Callisto has already had her pre-lay shed uh, almost a week ago, I would say. So Callisto is on her way, and I don't know what's going on with Electra. Uh, Electra went through a cycle. Now she doesn't seem like she's grabbing, even though she would be like 10 to 20 days away from laying eggs. Uh, she's back on food. Her behavior has been very strange. She's still very restless. Um, I just had her out last night to clean her and I, I, I can't tell. So it could just be a small clutch. Maybe she's not gravid now. I'm not sure what's going on with her. Uh, only time is going to tell. And then Morticia so far, nothing. Although she's been hiding a lot lately, which is not like her usual behavior. So I'm wondering if her body is going through some kind of cycle. I don't see or feel anything yet, but we'll, we'll see what happens with her. Uh, Lilith hasn't shown me any signs of being gravid. She's still on food. 
Uh, my Matrix girl, same thing. So that's all the girls I paired up. I only paired up seven females this year. So three either just had their prelay shed or about to. Electra is the question mark right now where I thought she had a prelay and I thought she was going to lay, but now I'm not so sure. And then the other three girls are still in limbo. Uh, we'll see what happens. If I don't see anything within the next 40 days, I'm gonna assume that they just didn't take this year uh, and aren't gonna go. This girl just wants to get over here in my face. Uh, as far as the channel goes, I did promise you guys I would make it to 100th episode. This is number 100. Uh, I will continue to make content. I'm just not sure uh, how much time and effort I'm going to put into things going forward at this point. So we'll see what happens with that. It really depends on if things pick up here and stay steady. Uh, right now, I'm not really seeing the engagement that I want to see um, to make this worthwhile for myself and for you guys. So we'll see what happens going forward. So for now, uh, I will make some videos, especially as eggs come and babies hatch and things like that, but I'm not sure how much structure we'll have on the channel. So make sure you hit the comments hard on this one. Try to push this video out there and let's see what we can do. All right, guys, we'll see you later. Thank you.